Did you understand the magnitude of what Roseanne was? I've had enough betrayal that loyalty is a huge thing for mm -hmm. me. Do I stand with her or do I stand with Wanda Sykes? Within 10 minutes, I got the first death threat phone call on the home phone. You were six years old yeah, and your was aunt sued yeah. you. Money can go really quick. I didn't get rich. And actually, I think that's the best gift I ever got. This is one of those moments where you get emotional. Uh, you got me crying over here. <laughs>、Michael, how are you
which, by the way, Roseanne was my favorite uh, sitcom growing up, and I thought, you know, I said it as an adult many times publicly. Um, the last season they had you, or it was written that you were into f directing. Mm -hmm. That was going to be what you... Did they take that from your real life? Were you already a budding director, or did you kind of think about it after you saw it on, on scene? I think everybody who grew up around me knew. I was already writing, yeah. and I was already technically just obsessed with all of it. I okay. love this business. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say because people can talk about the parts that are hard, and it is a business, and there is there is the business side of things. Yeah. But I never lost the magic, and I no. think that's a super important part. Is yeah. people do their best work if they still the kidding you should still come out. This is we're we're making magic. Like you walk onto a set and walk into a different world. How can you not love that? And I think that's contagious. And, mm -hmm. You know, as a director, I try to create an environment for people to be free to push themselves to try a you know, take a chance, because mm -hmm. this is what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Did you did you understand the magnitude of what Roseanne was while it was happening? Yeah, probably m uniquely in a way, maybe even more so than some of the adults, because um, their lives change dramatically and, and it changes your financials and all of these mm -hmm. things. Like, so you're in that whirlwind, right? But as a kid, you're somewhat removed because you're not really looking at numbers. You're not really looking at those things. You're looking at the environment, the space, the things you experience on a day to day. And then, you know, in 1990, when she sang the national anthem, mm -hmm. um, that was a life altering event for everybody because we went from being kind of like this heroic tale to overnight having the president be on the news and calling us all un-American. Yeah. And I'm the son of an immigrant and, and my family came here. So becoming American was a big part of their kind of framework. And then my mom's side comes from a really small town in the middle of nowhere in Virginia that were just kind of poor farmers who, who worked different jobs but really valued their heritage to overnight becoming, you know, Enemy kind of, number yeah, one. Yeah, enemy number yeah. one, yeah. you know, death threats, bomb scares, like, the reality hit me really quick, and then I was the guy who went out and did most of the press. So, what age were you? Uh, about eight, nine. Why did they send you to do most of the press? That was not your. No, well, <laughs> you're eight or nine years old. I was trained, and, oh and my the gosh. funny part about it is, I stepped into that role, and I loved that role. Really, it, it was. You're looking back on it, you can still say that was the gift. where I was supposed to be. Yeah, oh, oh interesting. Uh, it, greatest gift ever, mm. because it gave me the ability to do stuff like this and yeah. not like I don't panic. Yeah, because I went to people who didn't want us to to be good like yeah. I, I went to places where i was literally you're gonna get attacked yeah. so understand yeah. it wasn't punky writing. brewster getting like no. the beatles treatment yeah and, and so <laughs> at the time yeah, yeah. And, and so it's it's this is going to be a con conflict yeah and people have strong feelings and they're going to judge all of it mm. so for me but there was a limit right because i was a kid and so sometimes i could lean into that like if you're going to really hammer me yeah. as an adult you're gonna look really dumb really when dumb. when the nine year old turns to you and says, "I don't think that's an appropriate thing to say," right? Like <laughs> you can flip it. Yeah. But it was great training. It was great business training, and I think for me for life, man, it, it was one yeah. of the most empowering things. But you know, at one point, I did like ninety percent, ninety five percent of most of the press. I mean, I, two or three weekends a month. Yeah. Let me travel. I don't think you would know this. You would have any reason to know this, but I actually uh, met not only met Roseanne years ago but uh she invited me to her the studio that she had in la at the time at full moon high tide sorry full moon high tide yes exactly i worked there yeah. i actually do know this you do know this yeah. how do you know this because how i you know I, I used to build stuff for her so when you were coming what i this did would have some been of the setup early 15 years yeah, ago early 2000s it was 2007 i think yeah 2000 what yeah you were there i built so she did little kid music videos. I used to do a lot of stuff with her. I was the guy they called when they couldn't get stuff yeah, done. Yeah, you helped her with her with her talk show, all yeah. kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. So I just to let the audience know I had a, a music magazine and then a magazine for LGBTQ mm -hmm. people. And Margaret Cho was our cover. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Margaret, uh, we arranged for Margaret or for Roseanne to interview Margaret and vice versa, uh, which was just like a dream. And then. Um, she found out that like we were indie, an indie magazine, so she's like, "Don't pay for like a studio downtown. Come to my studio. We'll yeah. do it here." They did whole filming. It was pretty amazing, and she helped me know that I was not supposed to name my children after me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She got pretty pretty upset when she overheard me saying I was going to name all of my children Arlen yeah. uh, at the time. But you know what I what I recognized in her was a bit of a brilliance. 
mm. um, and um, a very interesting person. But I also understood there are some uh, eccentricities oh, yeah. that I noticed. And so what do you think? Do you think she's being fairly maligned right now? So it's an interesting thing. I have such a complex view on this because I have loved her my whole life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up with her, yeah. um, and in many ways, I was closer to her sometimes than her own kids, I think. Mm. And, you know, like, the example is I, I did stuff for her at Full Moon High Tide. I probably hung some of the lights that, that you sat under, and, and I could tell you pretty much the whole crew of people who worked there yeah, that day, yeah. and that was 15 years ago. I always cared. I will always care about her, and I think that's the part people have to understand. Every single person has known someone who said or did something that you don't agree with or you don't condone. I was very clear that day. Yeah, tell us what you said on Twitter that day. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. Cause, you know, if you want me to walk through that day. Yeah. So I had stayed up the night before because I was supposed to submit scripts for the show. For the Connors. For the Connors. And it was, uh, I think it was Memorial Weekend. I had stayed up till like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning doing my last checks of these two scripts that I wrote um, to potentially be used on. It, then it was Roseanne. Connors didn't exist. Mm. Um, you know, and I went to bed and somebody, I got a phone call and an email at about six o'clock in the morning. So nine o'clock on the East Coast saying, do I stand with her or do I stand with Wanda Sykes? Oh. And I'm like, I have no idea what, I, I don't know where we're standing about anything. And to me, I know well enough to know you don't say anything until you have some concept. Sure. Right. Nothing it had hit the news yet because it wasn't out there. She had taken down the original tweets and and but people had screenshotted them and it would all come out later mm. within 10 minutes i got the first death threat phone call on the home phone so mm -hmm. the answer machine's going off my kids are waking up to that i'm trying to figure out what's going on in the world and the truth is i'd spent a year and a half when we came back on roseanne telling people that we would never say something like this sure. that we would never say anything that was racist xenophobic or 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 Yes. You know, prejudicial. Given the fact that you had a black daughter on yeah. the show yourself. Which was Roseanne's idea. And and the thing is, she's a genius. Mm -hmm. Roseanne is an absolute genius and one of the best writer-producers I've ever seen, ever. I don't yeah. think she ever I got enough credit. I can believe that, yeah. I probably didn't understand how much mental health stuff was going on that she has expressed since. Mm -hmm. But for me, that doesn't change the statements. And I, mm -hmm. I adamantly condemned the statements that day. I did so before, you know, bef before it was really defined by the world what the outcome was. Because mm -hmm. to me, I coach kids. I've never had a private life. I've always been open. I've been very outspoken about where I stand about inclusion and community. And this is actually before I actually adopted my own children and, and my family's so diverse. Yeah, your two eldest are black. Yeah. One of them has passed. Yeah. Yes. So. It's, it was a really complex issue because for me, we have a responsibility as a public person. I hate when people st stomp so much and tell the world how to believe or what to believe, but at the same time, I do have a responsibility to be clear about what I put out into the world and what I share. Mm -hmm. And what your children see in you. And that's it. And, and for me, I was not okay with what she said. Everybody who knew me knew I was not okay with what she said that mm -hmm. day. And what I would tell you is, there's no one in my life who was confused by what I said, and no one is confused since. And, mm -hmm. and the thing is, I adamantly condemn the statements. But I also know that she's a human being, and human beings do make mistakes. And I said that day, this was out of character from my experience with her. Yeah. This is not who I knew her to be. Yeah. And I think that's why people were so angry, and rightfully so. Yeah, I, I felt this, I mean, obviously not the same, but I this was someone who I really liked. Um, and respected and admired. Mm -hmm. And I saw what she said. And I even saw Valerie, the person that she said it about. I saw her a couple of days after it happened. Okay. And I'm, I'm black, so I know the implications of it. Uh, I just do think R Roseanne has been crying, has been having cries of help for decades. She said, I have mental yes. issues, mental health issues. Um, the same way Kanye can't get a pass for having mental health issues, I'm not giving her a pass, but I, I do understand the complexities. I think that's the problem. I think we forget for a moment that they're human beings mm -hmm. and that sometimes human beings are suffering yeah. and that sometimes people don't fully grasp the scope of what they say and the yeah. impact it's going to have. Yeah. And, and what I would say to you is you get a choice in that moment. 
as I said to her that day, and I was calling and, and trying to reach her privately first and all these things, because I really wanted to give her the respect of, I'm gonna make this statement. Mm -hmm. I will give you the opportunity to tell me, hey, I think that's too harsh mm -hmm. or whatever. Like, I, cause I, I will always respect her. It's the same as, I wouldn't sign on to the Connors until she gave her okay for that show to exist. Yeah. Because there's a part of me, listen, I, you know, for me, I've had enough betrayal that loyalty is a huge thing for mm -hmm. me. And for me, I will always care for her. I, you know, yeah. I've spent time in her home and I will always care for her, the person, right? And what it made me is much more aware of the mental health aspect. And some part of me wishes I had seen more, but the other part says, hey, this is a line you don't cross. And like, that's the same thing with Kanye is like, I have a line for Kanye where it's like, look, I respect some of the work you've done. I respect some of the music, but there are things you're gonna put out into the world that mm -hmm. have huge detrimental impacts. Mm -hmm. And if you don't grasp that, even if it's a mental health portion, some lines you don't cross. Yeah, on your your would you say you're half Jewish? Is that how you would describe I, it? I well, I grew up in a Jewish home, a yeah. primarily Jewish home. My mom wasn't, but my dad is. Yeah. And you know, it's so funny, we put all these titles on everything, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a this, I'm a that. Like the truth is I'm a huge mutt and I'm a spiritual person, mm -hmm. but there's so much more than just being part of a religion or whatever. And we we do ourselves a disservice when we only define ourselves based on categories. I think that's one of the ways we've really separated people throughout history. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the ways people make us opponents when we really are all basically searching for the yeah. same things. We yeah. want to be able to raise a family. We want to be able to have, you know, consistency, some money to be able to provide. We want to have comfort. People just want to survive. And I think that's the thing that we forget at times is it's a lot easier to divide us if we can find places that we aren't the same. Sure. And the reality is our core, the needs, the wants, what it is to be a being. And that's the other part of, that's where prejudice and racism makes absolutely no sense. It's the stupidest thing in the world. If you go, if you're a religious person, you believe all people were created and they were created equal. If you're a scientific person, you believe everybody evolved, right? So basically we're all saying all of beings came from the same place in some sense and mm -hmm. evolved from each other and came from each other, right? Whether you're scientific or religious. So the idea that you're gonna hate arbitrarily is like the most absurd. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what your belief system is. You're using that as a justification. Absolutely. And I wanna go back to the survival and I wanna go back to mm -hmm. the, a little bit of the betrayal. And because of this, this is your first million, I have to kind of dig a little deep into um, you being a child actor. Yeah. And at one point I saw you say that you feel like your parents did the best they could, mm -hmm. but given the amount of money you were making, you should have had more yeah. after you left. So let's talk a little bit about that. Do you, can you remember when your cumulative uh, salary would have been a million, like you would have gained it over years? Well, so here's the thing. I didn't make nearly as much as everybody else. Yeah. And I was young and we came into this, my family was not an entertainment family, so we yeah. didn't know how we didn't know how the game worked, yes. right? Which is, that's half of business and half of money, right? The, that's the part, especially for inner city youth, as you come up, as you start to make money, you're in an environment where no one's ever taught you how to spend it. That's why you see athletes struggle so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. In my case, you know, I, I had things right away that turned what could have been a good situation to a much more chaotic one, including my aunt sued me for a portion as a manager and like I had chaos from the get-go, right? So money became this chaotic thing. How old were you when your aunt sued six. you? You were six years old yeah, when it was your a, aunt sued yeah, you. Yeah, it was a six-year process. Like it was it was a long, so family got dynamics got shattered and, and I was in the middle of that. And so you take on some of that trauma and there's betrayal there. And because there's a court case, my parents couldn't invest the way you would normally and what people don't understand is you know in entertainment 10 percent to an agent 15 percent or more to a manager that's 25 percent before anything mm. ever came that's off the top for the gross for all those business people and then you start going taxes and now if you can't defend any of that or invest any of that it goes quick mm. and so i think that's one of the things people don't understand is how quickly now do you have a publicist do you have a lawyer do you have all of these other ancillary things a stylist you know money can go really quick yeah. so for me i didn't get rich and actually i think that's the best gift i ever got now sarah sarah uh, who played darlene she got rich right <laughs> I, I don't speak on anybody else's <laughs> I money think she I, got rich. I, I, I think what? she got rich that's i think I she's see. doing very good because she gets two paychecks now because she's an executive <laughs> yes. too so you know i and there's things that you should do in your con 
contractual stuff. Like I didn't own a piece of the show. I'm one of the mm. only. I'm the as far as I know, I'm one of the only original cast members who doesn't. Yeah. Why are you saying this with a smile? By the way, what? How? How are you? What part of your piece, inner piece, allows you to be okay with that? Be well. Two things. The first one is. If you don't learn from the lesson and learn how to laugh through this, I mean, I'm an optimistic person to begin with. So there's a part of it where it's a bit like Monopoly money because I never had it, right? Mm. So even though it's lost, in a sense, it is lost, but it's just money. And I know that sounds funny, yeah. but when you're working all the time, the other part is how much do you believe in you? There's been plenty of times in my life where I, I'll take a contract that other people think is not good enough and I'll go, that's fine, I'll show you because mm. I'm going to bet on me. And the truth is, I write all the time. I write and I direct and I act. So there's a lot of different avenues. You know, I'm building two charities and doing all this stuff. Like, the money will find. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a difference. I think it separates people. But that's the advantage of growing up around people who had money. The truth is, when you're around people who have made a lot of money in business, you learn early on, you're going to have to make more. You're going to have to work more. Mm -hmm. So it changes your, your mindset and framework. And that's an advantage that people who have yeah. been around high-level people have. Well, with your directing and your writing, do you currently direct and write for other sitcoms? I could see you doing that. Is that something that you are actively looking for? Or is oh, it, yeah. I mean, yeah. the plan is to direct not just sitcoms, but, you know, films and other stuff. And I'm in talks right now for a couple little features and things. Yeah. But it's the right projects, because the most dangerous thing, you know, the most yeah. dangerous thing is to invest all your time or energy in something that's yeah. not what you want. Yeah. You're, you're kind of defining your narrative and your view, right? Yeah. And then as a writer, it's always like, I guess part of it is I have to look at it like, I'm going to sell enough shows and do enough work. I'm not going to sweat what happened in the past. I can't do anything about that's it. That's right. That's what. That's the key to it, because you are just 40, 41. Yeah. yeah. And so I think, you know who I think about another co-star of yours, John Goodman. Mm -hmm. Almost every year he's in a movie, he's with the Coen brothers, he's doing this, he's at a TV show. I see that for the next 40 years of your career, doing these guest spots and then directing, doing a ton of the directing stuff. Because I saw your your clips behind the scenes while you were doing that, and yeah. that seemed to me to be you and your element. It, it is. I, I have different parts of my personality. Yeah. I love the technical side of things. So directing yeah. is beautiful because it's, it's almost setting the stage for everybody else. And yeah. I value people in such a high regard. Yeah. It's a beautiful job to get to empower people. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. The acting part, I, nobody's seen my best work yet. Mm. I mean, even my very best stuff on the Connors, a lot of it ended up getting cut because of time and all this yeah. stuff. But my really, I'm probably much more from a dramatic side. That's really where I'm going to kind of take off. And it's funny because when we came back, I was the same age John was when he started. So when you do that math, it's like, I got a 30-year head start. I'm not going to compare myself to John. John is a unique individual. John is his own person. Mm. But when you look at that, it's like, I got 40 more years to do stuff. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, and easily 20 shows, 20 movies in the next 40 years on some side of things. Like, I write all the time. It, it really, if, I, if I'm, people can make you get crazy about, mm -hmm. like, I haven't done enough yet. Yeah. So you have to step back sometimes and go, yeah, there's more there. And, and if you want it, get hungry and get busy. Yeah. That's a clip. <laughs> well, I mean, you 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 embody like a confidence and and a kind of a contentment, but with the fire underneath that, which is really really great. Is there anything that you would say to parents of of children or teenagers who are either in the acting business or any anything athletes, any of that? Anything that you can tell them that'll help them when it comes to the finances of their children? Yeah, here's what I'll tell people. I, I'm a warrior, right? And and I I come in calm but there is a fire i've also been a coach for 25 years i've worked with children at every age all the way from t-ball kids you know at four years old all the way through professional and i did that professionally i was a high school coach for 10 years so i've guided other people on this path to kind of seeing what it comes the first part is know your business or know your details ask the questions there are no dumb questions if you really want to know and now with the internet you can find out everything but I live by a really simple philosophy that I taught my kids, which is if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. Now you define the it. And the truth about money is money's a magnifier. If we're really being honest, money doesn't tell you who somebody is. Money helps that person show the world who they are. It just magnifies. So 
if you're a kind person, you can go out and do a bunch of really kind stuff. If you're a selfish person, you can do a lot of selfish stuff. If you're a person who's ego-based and needs to show people, you're gonna show people and maybe to your detriment. And if you're kind of a narcissistic uh, negative person, you're gonna go out and smash a lot of people along the way, but that's gonna be a real short ride because mm. people will be waiting to help you on the backside of that come back down. Mm -hmm. And so understand, don't spend. Don't spend your first check. Don't, don't immediately go out and make the most, have one purchase that you really want, something that you really saved or something for your family and then start trying to live on a small percentage. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear some, you know, high level people talk about 10, 20, 30%. That's a luxury. But if you're an athlete, you can live really good on about 20% of what you make. Start putting stuff away. Yeah. Start making plans for your children so that your kids don't have to struggle the same way. In my whole journey, I always found a way. You know, I've worked a lot of terrible jobs, which is why every day on set is magical for me. It's why people don't understand. I've run cable for five miles in the electrical department, right? So when I get to show up late as an actor, right, I'm the director, and I get to walk in and tell people where to go, and I try really hard to think ahead so somebody doesn't have to, you know, take 100-yard Saco cable five miles at, you know, a couple hundred pounds a, a cable, is about perspective. Mm. And for young people, don't lose your perspective of what's important. And don't let the people who are related to you or family or friends use that to make you go outside of yourself yeah amazing I, I yeah I think there there are thousands and thousands of, of child actors around the country and their parents and the people who care about them and they see a lot of these uh, uh, stories right of mm -hmm. people who either didn't make it to their 20s or are down and out. I mean, how do you how do you view that? Because as we wrap up that topic, like how do you view when you see somebody that you grew up with, you kind of saw them out and about, but they're no longer here or they're just not doing well? Well, I lost a lot of people along the way. Mm. I mean, that that's a tremendous part of my life mm. is dealing with grief and losing people. Um, what I would tell people is, look, I had a stint real briefly where I was homeless. Yeah. And most people are not aware of that. I mean, that's something, that path back and what it does to you on the inside, right? Because there's a part of you, even when you first get out of that, like, do people know, mm -hmm, right? Like there's mm -hmm. part of you that, that, that changes the way you view things and possessions, right? I'm, a, I'm not a big possessions guy, partially yeah, because of yeah. those two periods of my life, yeah. right? Like I have a simple. couch in my living room and there's a couch and everybody's like, Where, where's your stuff? I'm like, right. that's it. That's, that's it. it. That's, that's, that, that's, what, I that's what I need, right? Yeah. And it's like, I don't need all the other stuff. Yeah. And what I would tell people is, that thing about it, you get to define what matters to you. Mm. And for young people, stop looking at somebody's Instagram. It's why my Instagram, my social media, isn't just my highlight reel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's because I want you to understand it's not all easy. No. The homelessness, was. there was this day that, and we, it did resonate with me. Um, I didn't know about that. There was this day that you said, I guess you knew you were going to be, you're not going to have a place to stay that night mm -hmm. or something. And you kind of had some phone numbers from the, from your old crew, yep. maybe actors as well. Yeah. And you called everybody yep. and nobody answered or, or said yes yep. to helping. Yeah. I've been in that position. Um, you know, the people, what I found is the people who can help you usually don't, but the people who can't help you want to. Yeah. yeah, they want to and they try. Like my family, you know, they never really had anything, but they were always putting stuff together to make it yeah. happen. That's why we roll like this. Like we roll everywhere together. Uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. So, so tell me in that day, like you were in a, like an actual phone booth or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's really interesting because, you know, I took this list, right. And I've kept track of cast and crew lists since I was six years old. I circled people's names, people I would hire. Yeah. I've been, I've been planning on being on this side of things for a really long time. So I knew who I wanted. But that night, you know, I had like 20 bucks. Yeah. And at a quarter a piece, you know, I probably called about 60 people, worked down that list. And in those days, I had a pager. I mean, yeah. a time period. And I sat at a bus stop. Yep. Next to a payphone, waiting for, waiting for it to go off, right? Yeah. Waiting for someone to call either the pager or the phone, which there's nothing more lonely. And, you know, for young people, they won't totally grasp it but sitting at a payphone hoping somebody's gonna call because you got nowhere to go there's no answer there's no solution and you run out of you run out of 
first thing you run out of is excuses. <laughs> you run out of like, there's no, and I laugh because it was a great check your life moment mm-hmm. for me. What do you What here. do you think? What do you think? I mean, do you see some of those people? You have to run into oh, some yeah, of those people with now. So, and yeah, it's complicated because some people didn't know, and some people didn't know if they knew exactly what was going on. Maybe they would have called. And some people don't want to get involved. Yeah. And, and there's a part of me as the adult mm. who can see that part. How that old were you when this sense. happened? Mm, Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. 15, so right 16. after the show ended. Yeah. Not that long. A couple months. You didn't have about enough six money. Months, you know. Well. Mm. It, it's not so much money, right? Because when you're that age, it's not like you have a job. Most people, yeah. I do, but like yeah. you know, but you also don't have access, right? Yeah. So even if you have money, what good is it to you? Yeah. And so I just remember I sat there all night until basically the last bus came. Yeah. And the dri- they must have talked on the radio because when the driver got there, he just looked at me and he's like, "Are you going to get on?" And I'm like, "I, I really didn't know." Yeah. Where did you end up? Yeah. Where did you end up? Uh, I took the bus all the way to the very end till he had to go take it back to the station. And he stopped. And it's I. this is one of those moments where you get emotional. And I still do. 20, almost 25 years later is he stopped the bus and said, I have to take it back. And he said, I can't take you with me. And so he opened his lunch and he, he gave me a tuna fish sandwich, which I've never liked tuna fish, but I ate it, and an apple. And I spent about five years after, you know, a couple weeks later, I, you know, I kind of cleaned things up, found a place, re kind of set my life, got back into school. I spent about five years going and looking for the bus driver. Like mm-hmm. I, 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 yeah, because I was like, I have to find a way to make this up to this person. But it's that moment of kindness. Like if you ask me what makes me, you know, you mm-hmm. ask me what makes me so nice or kind, it's moments like that. Yeah. Is that in my lowest moments, there was someone there. And so someone who my, didn't know you. You didn't know me. Yeah. And so my job as a coach of kids, as a guy on a set when I walk on and I first meet people, when I come to you guys, yeah, people's names matter. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the room matters. And so for me, I might be my one opportunity to meet you, but I'm going to bring my kindness because I know what it's like when you can't find any. Mm. Yeah, I I had so many flashback moments while you were talking um, to very particular times in Hollywood. Actually, I, I'm in a in a high rise in Hollywood now, and I can I can see from my window where I used to walk at night mm. because I didn't have a place to live, and, people and kind of on it. purpose. Yeah, and you walk. You walk to stay warm. You walk to, because you're yeah. lost. You walk because you where where can I go? Where can I go? There's yeah. nowhere. It's so and it's so hard to explain to yeah. people. Yeah, it is. Especially if you've had some success before it and you have people in your life and yeah. some people come back and they're very guilty and it's like, you know, the guilt doesn't really help today. What helps is, you <laughs> no. know, so don't ever let it happen again with someone else. That's the only thing I ask. That's it. Yeah. And, and you know, I've been profoundly lucky throughout my life. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people, if I help somebody, I don't want you to pay me back. Mm-hmm. I want gift. you to go pay it forward. Mm-hmm. I want you to do something for someone. And usually, you know, if you really want to know the definition of most people, it's what do they do for people who can't do anything for them. That's right. That's right. Um, speaking of an emotional topic, mm-hmm. would you mind if we talked a little bit about your son? You can. Yeah. yeah so you have, uh, tell me his name. Uh, Larry. Larry. So I have five kids. I have uh, two from my original marriage who are in their 20s and in college. Then, uh, after my marriage, right after my marriage, I got introduced to Larry's older sister, Camille, uh, who asked me if I would be her dad. She never had one. And I she, saw a picture. Is she black? Yeah. I just want, I know I, we're not defining people, yeah. but to yeah. me, it, it's important. Well, me. I'll tell you why it is important. Sometimes, and I, I say this for a lot of people, is you don't realize the privilege you have. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I spent some of my teenage years in Compton, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I was very aware of not being the one who fit in and watching how prejudice it exists yes. and yeah. how other people experienced it f- far beyond anything I experienced. Yes, because even homeless, you don't have to worry about the police the same taking way. your life over a traffic incident. Well, and when you, you know, I have a complex background. My dad was born in China and then grew up in Israel and then came to the United States, so I'm a mutt anyway, yeah. but outwardly, white guy. I'm a pale skin, yeah, white like, guy. like and, and easily passing for anything you want, Yeah, right? Then when you have 
young children, well, they're not young, but they were young adults of color that you're raising. And you walk in the store with two sets of kids, and I got four kids in this store, and two of them are messing around and no one cares, but two of them are messing around and being followed by security. Ugh. Or loss prevention or loss retention comes over the thing on aisle four, you're like, that's where my kids are. Like, uh. And I'm standing next to this person who's making this idiot. And they, people don't realize what that experience is like. And I had a concept, right? But it's different when you're your kids, right? And so it became more apparent to me. And, more, and it, that also has been a tremendous great lesson for me, especially as I'm writing and producing and making stories, because mm. it gave me perspective. And then I ask my daughter all the time, so my son was in the foster care system, um, which is its own, you know, yes. I, I would use certain language that probably would not be appropriate that most people wouldn't want me to hear, because it is the frustrating and we started fighting for his education rights and fighting for housing and trying to get him out of a group home. And this is Camille's younger brother. Younger Larry. brother that yeah. she asked you to, to take on. Yeah. And yeah. so I started the paperwork to adopt him. And then the social worker said, you shouldn't. He said, you definitely shouldn't because he'll lose a lot of his rights and, and things that will be given to him as a young adult. Mm -hmm. So that was a really fine line of gaining access and again so i don't have official standing but i am basically mm -hmm. raising this mm -hmm. kid and then same thing with camille and so we're piecing it together and she's fighting for rights so she can have them so that i can exercise them and you know when you go and you have to fight just to get a kid into you know he was at a high school where even if he finishes all the classes he's not going to graduate hmm. so it's like a it's a formality to failure and it's it's probably my greatest failure in a lot of ways and in my most heartbreaking thing is I was so determined for him not to be a statistic and um, he went to live with his sister for a little while he moved out nobody really told me that he moved out and he went to go stay at, at this kind of group home slash somebody he knew mm -hmm. and tried some drugs one night that had fentanyl in him which is an absolute crisis in this country and he's one of seven or eight young people who are no longer with us because somebody wanted to make a little more money and it was gut-wrenching heartbreaking mm -hmm. um i came into his life and i thought i had more time and arlen i tell you i was the perfect person because i knew what it was like to be kind of thrown away as a teenager i knew what it was like to be young and angry i knew what it was like to be a young man who didn't see your path right who thought you understood but then and then had to rebuild and I'm, it's a combination of ashamed and embarrassed from the standpoint of like, he had signed up for college. He had done all these things that we were building towards, but he hadn't told me, he didn't want to tell me until he had to had the success. Hmm. So I know I made the impact, but he, you know, I can't hug him. He's not here. You think you have more time. So my message to parents is always like, make sure that you take value of your time, you know? And it's, honestly, I was already, in my opinion, you know, it's boastful to say, but I felt like I was a pretty good man, a, a grateful, appreciative person, you know, the kind of guy who adopts two adult children and, and takes people into their home. And I've raised other people's kids along the way when I was coaching. Um, but he made me a better man in a lot of ways. And, um, <laughs> sorry, but that loss you can't explain it to anyone you know grief is this amazing it's a beautiful gift and i try to explain that to people is it's the gift it's the gift of the love i didn't get to express it's the gift of remembering him daily it's the gift of what would this smart ass tell me <laughs> you know <laughs> um how would he critique this and then also you know when i see when i see george floyd Mm -hmm. You know, and any one of these, you know, God, we could go down a list of names Absolutely. that's so long. And the, the most embarrassing part of that is the list of names we know is a tenth or a hundredth of yeah. the list of names that exists. And, but I see my own son. I see teaching my son to drive, right? And I have my older biological son. And I was very particular because of my experiences spending time in Compton about how you handle situations with the police, but the worry of having my son who, who was black, who that's how the world sees him. Yes. Yes. 
And, and at times, that's the, the first thing people see. And for some people, that's all they see because that's all they want to see. That's the prism of their view. Do you think talking to, I mean, talking to other white parents and white people yeah. that you can you can reach people i think i think you can i think that's that because we know black people yeah. know that all yes. day you know yes. my brother has six children and he has to teach them how to put their hands when the, if somebody comes over it's terrifying the idea that the people you're supposed to run to yeah are the ones you have to worry about at times yeah and that's not all of them and i have friends Absolutely. in law enforcement yes. and, I, and i i love first responders right yeah but if we don't admit we have a problem and change the way we go about this, we're losing great people. One of these people that we've lost could have been the person who cured cancer. Mm -hmm. One of these people could have been the person who changed and was the next president. Or even and if they weren't, they were, like you said, they're, everyone in the room matters. They all matter. They're somebody's so, e so what I family. don't like is when people are like, well, they were a good person. I don't care if they're a terrible person. They didn't deserve this execution. They did not deserve yeah. a tragedy. They're all tragedies, yeah. and that's the part we have to stop telling me their past. Because just the other part, mm. I'm not my past. Mm. You're not your past. And as two people who at one point were homeless, we should be a shining example of like where you came from or who you were yesterday does not have to be who you are today. You can change anytime you want. So we're making a real crappy value judgment to appease people's like weird prism that they see the world through mm -hmm. and what i would tell you is i have the beautiful gift of with my daughter camille who's a filmmaker who has her own experiences with dcfs and adoption and the court system that's one place my job is to empower her mm -hmm. right and it's hard to watch a, a how she defines herself as a young black woman who doesn't always get the same opportunities mm -hmm. so it's my job to help and i was already fighting for inclusion before but man, if people thought I was a warrior for it before, yeah. you know, if, if you're paying attention, this is not a problem just in one community. This is a problem for our society. Mm -hmm. Racism is denying all of us the community and the society that we were supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And this is as much a white problem as it is any other group because your oppression of other people and the way you go about this is denying you. It's denying you scope. It's denying you community. It's denying you the life that you should have. But more importantly, it's denying you an actual society that is balanced, fair, loving, compassionate. This is where we have to make the change, mm -hmm. right? Because, and that's where writing and directing is. The beauty of that is on that side, I get to make my set diverse. I get to make this script, not just inclusive, but carry messages that matter that I feel people should be looking at. And part of it is people have guilt and they should. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of people in this country who want to hide our history or hide, you know, how, you know, they look at the fight right now over, over proud yeah. parents and, and, and all these things and all like, Hey, get over yourself for a minute and listen. Cause that's the first part. The first part is I'll tell you, I have children who identify as being black. And they didn't like the term African American. They mm -hmm. they're proud of being. Yeah, it's black usually children. a younger generation. Yeah. They're teaching me things all the time. Yeah. And I have to be smart enough. I'm invested already, and I'm still learning. That's yeah. the part. So for everybody else, open your eyes and listen, because yeah. the first thing that should happen after every one of these tragedies, the first time that there's a conflict, racially, socially, you know, LGBTQ, mm -hmm. like. Slow down and stop trying to tell everybody either that you're an ally or how you weren't involved. Shut up for a minute. Listen and understand if you really want to be an ally, it starts by understanding somebody else's experience and hearing them mm. and then empowering their voice. Because as much as I can take this fight out into the world, that's nothing compared to what my daughter's going to do. And that's my job. My job is to make sure that I stand with her and that I help lift her. And that I, if I can open a door and you know, if you can't open the door, open the window. If you can't do any of that stuff, break down the walls. Yeah. If you gotta go outside with everybody, then let's go outside and build a better community and be more inclusive. But the truth is that empowers all of us. And it's those poor young kids that I look at, you know, I've coached kids long enough. You put them all on a team, they don't care what the person next to them looks like until some ignorant adult starts telling them that's the case, right? We don't start this way. Racism isn't some inherent thing or some 
disease that you catch, right? This is something we teach people out of ignorance or out of fear. Mm. And we can solve it. That's the part. I think you are, uh, you're the antidote to anything that's negative that's come out of the what happened with Roseanne. Mm. Um, her personal kind of battle with mental health issues aside. Right. And what you said there about your daughter, not only is she going to take that fight for, for black women and black people, but I also think, and I hope for you that um, what you're doing with her helps start to heal some of what happened with your son um, because you, you use words like embarrassed and, and regretful and all that, which yeah. understood. But to me, I feel like he knew. Mm. He knew he had a dad. <laughs> yeah, it's... That's that's the gift that you gave him. It, it's little things, like about a month before, mm. one of his friends committed suicide. And mm. that's another crisis we could talk about. Yeah. That my life has been wrapped around. Yeah. Um, he went to his first funeral. Yeah. And I remember that morning we got up and uh, he dressed in the best clothes he had. Mm -hmm. And I turned to him and I said, how do you feel? And he goes, I, I, don't, I don't know. And, Am I supposed to wear a suit? And I'm like, I had an old suit in the closet. Mm -hmm. And it's one of my regrets. You know, he was buried in this suit. Mm. Um, that, but at the end, I didn't get to make any of those decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the other part we got to figure out is we've let legality get in the way of decency. Mm -hmm. And we got to change laws and, and, and start really representing children, representing our community figuring out better ways to do education, but also stripping some of these inherent biases in the system. Because mm -hmm. they hold everybody back. Because they were kind of in control of things. Yeah. Just in there. And, and, but I'll tell you, you know, we went to this funeral and, you know, I, I laughed because in the car, it's one of the best things that ever happened. At some point, I'll probably write something about it. He turns to me, he goes, how's it feel? And this was Larry. I said, I said, <laughs> this is typical him. I said, I said, what do you mean, how's it feel? He goes, how's it feel to know that I look better in this than you probably ever did? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, you know, I think that's true. Yeah. I said, how about when we're done today, we take that to a tailor and we get it altered for you. Mm. And that's your first suit. Mm. And he goes, he never called me dad, mm -hmm. but that was the closest that day. He goes, he goes, you're all right. Mm -hmm. He goes, I could see this working for us long term. Yeah, yeah. And I started laughing and I was like, I was like, yeah. And he goes, he goes, but just remember. I look make this look made way better yeah. than you've ever. And I was like, I agree. I agree. I'm with you. Yes. Yes. You know? Well, um, I could talk to you for like hours and hours and hours. And uh, you got me crying over here. <laughs> I just, if we're not moved to tears sometimes, mm -hmm. probably not having the deep enough conversation. Yeah. And, and yeah. I would tell you, thank you. I hope that people hear bits and pieces of this. And I hope something sparks something in someone. Oh, it has Because I, I know that's part of your mission, too. Absolutely. I want to catalyze every single day of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I want to thank you for your time, for your transparency, for the gems you've dropped during this conversation. I know it's going to help so many different people in different ways. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. And it's, any way people can keep in touch with you. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm... I'm the rare person that actually reads his own social media, which is dangerous at times. Get a lot of death threats and a lot of ugly stuff. Uh, and the flip side of that is I turn it into positive stuff. Okay. I mean, it's, it's been my nature. So Real M. Fishman, R-E-E-L, M. Fishman, people can pretty much contact me across the board. And then television and movies, you know, I'm going to be writing and, and there's a bunch of stuff. You know, I'm in the yeah. process of pitching and selling and, and finalizing stuff. So I'm not going anywhere. You you said 40 years. I'm going to say a good another 40, 45 years of this is what I want to do. Wonderful. I look forward to that. I look forward to seeing your name and all the credits. Uh, I prefer you come and, and join and come to a set and be a part of something. Hey, if you can get a director gig on General Hospital. Okay. Is that is that the that's dream? The, that's the dream. That's okay. the... I don't want to do anything else. I want to be an actor. Okay. But I love General Hospital with all my heart. Okay. Well, what I if I mean. what if I do an episode and you come and shadow me so you can be there and help you yeah. part of it? Yeah. I'll work? do that too. Yeah. Okay. And I I look really good in scrubs. That's all I'm okay. saying. I look good. In I scrubs. actually do too, but I never get the chance to wear them. <laughs> I like, can see that. I, I went to nursing school <laughs> at one point in my life, and I was a rescue diver. So like, oh my god, I'm always like, I never get to play any of the stuff that fits me, right? Yeah. Like military stuff, police yes. stuff. Like, I'm like, I'm like, you how can is do this that. Not? So so that's why I I really do see you. I envision you over the next few decades in these types of roles, and like you said, dr drama being being a big part of that. So I look forward to all of it. 
It's my pleasure, and we'll spend more time talking. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.